course, there's a huge difference between systems research and uh, commodity programs and a huge amount of added value, and it's well documented. So uh, we know the sort of basic uh, uh, field sort of approach, the idea of a, an industrial agriculture where you stick in more inputs and you get more output, and of course you also increase risk, because if things fail, then uh, you, you've put things in without getting them back. We also know that this just isn't what most of the smallholder farmers who haven't benefited from the, the Green Revolution are doing. They've got their crop production, their livestock production, embedded within a complex livelihood system. And that's critical. It's not just a farming system. It's a livelihood system and the non-agricultural activities, opportunities for improving livelihoods through processing and, and, and other elements. And of course, these myriad livelihood systems sit within a landscape context. And we have interlocking livelihoods, something that the sustainable uh, livelihood systems framework never really took into account that if you improve one person's livelihood, let's say settled agriculturists in a particular area, then people uh, moving their animals through that same landscape may well end up with their livelihood being uh, diminished. So the, the interlocking and interactions amongst those livelihoods, the bridging and binding social capital uh, involved in governing change in those sorts of systems uh, becomes uh, very important. And then, as we see, um, markets critically connect people across huge scales, from uh, farmers in Africa with consumers um, in Europe and North America, through certification schemes, being able to add value precisely because your production uh, is sustainable. Um, and these are um, critical ways in which it's the whole agri-food system that we often need to take into account when we're looking at change and we need to understand how change will propagate um, through that um, multi-scale system. That's vertical integration across scales and I think we're all familiar with it. Clearly there is also the horizontal integration that has to be going on at the same time because you simply can't separate water, food and energy in smallholder production systems. You need um, to be catering for all three in an integrated way and they affect each other incredibly and, and in terms of livelihood outcomes. So where is the documentation? What, what, what are the clear things? There's a very well documented example in Nepal um, where uh, maize yields are increased by 30 percent by simply allowing farmers to select maize varieties from what already existed that suited their system. Why did that work? Because their objective is not just to produce more maize. Their objective is the total factor productivity of their farming system. And what they actually do is plant maize at way above the recommended density, thin it to way below the recommended density, relay crop with millet. They do all of this on crop terraces um, that have trees on them because the critical thing is keeping livestock alive during the dry winter um, and that's what provides the fertility for the cropland and so you're optimizing the whole system and you need a different type of maize for that than the conventional varieties that were selected for uh, clean terraces in a, uh, as though you're operating an industrial agriculture and that situation is documented over 10 years from the initial um, uh, farmer knowledge of what was going on and why farmers were doing what they were doing through looking at what type of maize uh, they needed, allowing them to select from what was available uh, and achieving um, yields in the field and then the physiological explanation for why the varieties they preferred perform better in the circumstances that they do. And maybe we need a meta-analysis of these sort of case studies. The real problem is that there's very rarely a counterfactual. What have you got that you can say has, has been different than the system approach uh, that was taken? And so meta-analysis becomes difficult. But clearly we need 
to gather those, the, the, uh, that documentation very well so that it's clear what the added value of a systems approach is. Now, what's the challenge to scaling these sorts of systems interventions? Well, the big problem is fine grain variation in context. Participatory research is great. We need the, the bottom-up approach, the, the, the empowerment of the, the, the farmer. But the difficulty is, if you get everything right for one particular community, when you move to the next one, you find that, that, that it doesn't uh, automatically scale out. And that's because uh, of variations in a whole host of factors, in soil, in climate, in farming practices, in the household characteristics, the labor availability and so on, uh, the opportunities for markets, um, social capital, the extent to which people are able to uh, um, cooperate or not in different circumstances, and policy uh, and how that policy is implemented. And all of these contextual factors, and this is just a, an exemplar of the sorts of factors that matter, uh, that there are uh, others which will be important in different uh, particular cases. Um, but they do all vary at a fine scale. Now you might think policy doesn't vary at fine scales. But the impact of policy on uh, farm households generally does. Because you have different uh, implementation, even of national policy, in different circumstances. And the relationships that people have to um, uh, the legal systems and, and, and uh, the institutions that exist uh, vary. So the impact uh, varies. So what is it that we're trying to scale up? Well, sometimes when, when we look at, uh, at participatory research outputs, we say, well, OK, it, it's not that we can scale up any particular options. The innovation process has to happen locally. So the only thing that we can scale up is the process itself. But that's not enough. If we haven't got options to offer farmers, then what are we doing as uh, an international um, research organization. We've got to have options and we've got to know where those options and for whom those options might make a, a sensible um, intervention. Now, what, what do we mean by an option? Well, I, I guess at the beginning of farming systems research most options were technologies. They were uh, uh, interventions that, that affected the components um, uh, the varieties, the, the, the fertilizer, the inputs, uh, and the way that they were managed. I think over the last quarter of a century, we've increasingly incorporated um, delivery mechanisms um, and markets. And these go together because you can have a private-based market or you can have a government-organized extension system, uh, quite often doing uh, as, as alternatives for the same sort of supply issues. And then we've got the appropriate enabling uh, policy and institutional environment. And what is an option and, and what is context can to some extent vary, depending on the size of, of, of the interventions that you're trying to make. If you are unable to affect policies and institutions in certain cases, you may have to take them as part of the context. In other cases, your key intervention involves making an institutional change. So, if we take this sort of view, then we start with needing to understand what do we know about the options that are available in, in a particular uh, context, and how do those options suit the variability across the, the scaling domain. So, we start with a matrix of uh, options by context, and I'll talk a, a little bit more about that in a moment. And what's amazing at the moment is it's very hard to find this information. If you go and you ask, you find quite often lots of different projects going on, doing different things. There are some successes here and there, but if you say, I want to compile what interventions options are available, and for what places and for what type of people are they uh, relevant, it's very difficult to find that information collated in a useful way that grassroots extension staff 
can use. Very, very difficult indeed. So, but we, we are now in a position where technology is giving us much greater ability to characterize variation uh, across scaling domains. We've got big social survey instruments that are, are now happening. We've got remote sensing and, and real-time interpretation of it that allows us to look at trends over time at multiple scales. And if we put those two together, a good characterization of um, um, variability and um, uh, the options by context, then we can look at what do we still need to know. Because the riskiness for farmers being offered options is that if they're not well targeted, then whether or not uh, an option works is a key risk. Scaling up is about uh, getting more people in a particular area to adopt. And in that case, it's a matter of providing tools for um, the, the, the options to be matched to context. Understanding how independent contextual factors affect uh, uh, adoptability or suitability of different options allows you to scale out. So we're moving away from a tyranny of typology and looking at the individual contextual factors so that we can understand for a new situation uh, which things uh, may or may not work. So this is taking the familiar G by E uh, interaction, where you've got different varieties that might do better uh, in relation to a particular environmental stress, uh, some that may be less sensitive and therefore more resilient. And we take, instead of just looking at genotypes, we're now looking at this more complex co concept of an option. In terms of the environment, we're now looking at a broader uh, interpretation uh, of context that includes socioeconomic as well as biophysical aspects. And we need performance measures that are, uh, again, eclectic and looking at what farmers uh, really uh, need to know about. Not just yield, but also things like resilience. And this means moving away from the fixation on mean differences that we've had. This is a meta-analysis of impacts of fertilizer trees on um, maize yield, looking at the yield above um, a uh, control. And we can see that you get about a doubling of maize yields across 60 trials in sub-Saharan Africa. But that's a mean difference. You look at the standard errors around those means, some farmers are getting a fantastic advantage, some the intervention is no better than doing nothing at all. And what we've got to do is start forgetting about the mean differences and start exploring why are we getting uh, higher, uh, where are the points that we get that better performance so that we can advise uh, farmers what are the suite of options that they might want to select from. So if we look at the cumulative probability of getting more than a tonne of maize for our fertilizer tree interventions, we can start seeing that on certain soil types like nitrosols, there's a 50% probability of no increase in, in yield whatsoever. Whereas for luvisols, there's a 60% probability of getting more than a, a, a tonne per hectare. And you can then map these aspects. If you've got the data across large scaling domains, then you can start looking at different species, um, how they fare in relation to different uh, landscape elements, how they work in relation to modelling uh, the response of a particular species, in this case, Hispania, over altitude, rainfall, soil phosphorus, uh, and a soil texture element. So you need to be able to customise your recommendations to the local circumstances. Using the sorts of remote sensing we've got, we can start pulling together and identifying where the key places to work are if we want to make big gains. This is the Horn of Africa. You see vegetation production. And the next uh, one coming along the top, um, you see that adjusted for rainfall. And then you see the coefficient of variation. And that's showing you where you've got a problem in food resilience. If you then overlay um, population data on that, you can pinpoint exactly where you've got uh, a high lack of resilience in food production coupled uh, with population. And that, uh, obviously, is where you can make the biggest gains in terms of a uh, key option to intervene. Is this approach being taken up? It may sound too complicated. Well, it is. The Ministry of uh, Environment and Agriculture in Peru came 
uh, to us recently and said, can you give us prescriptions for cocoa agroforestry for 54 million hectares of Peru? And we said, no, you need to look at different options for different contexts. And they've now bought into that process and that is ongoing in a, an integrated project in Peru. I haven't got time to go into them now, but there are three videos that show this type of um, options by context in action in the Democratic Republic of, uh, of Congo, Ethiopia, uh, and in the Sahel. This was supposed to be a slide that had an animated paternoster lift going around. A paternoster lift goes up and then it clicks over the top uh, and then comes back down. So we've got to get away from bottom up, top down. You need them both at the same time because you need to be able to work bottom up in order to look at what are appropriate options, but you need to be able to spread those to millions of farmers and millions of hectares if we're going to make any sort of impact um, on, on key agricultural problems. So what are the key steps? Optimize the system, not one component. So we're looking at total factor productivity. We need vertical and horizontal integration. That's across scales and across sectors, both at the same time. And we need options by context, not silver bullets. So systematic large end trials of a range of options over a range of contexts. And that means uh, um, blending the development money, which is large enough. If we look at what development organizations do, they are working at a large scale across ranges of context. They have the resources to do it. In research, we generally don't. In development, generally, very little evidence is used on what works where, so we can increase the impact of the development dollar by embedding nested scale options and plan comparisons in a co-learning cycle. Obviously, we need proper measures of performance with appropriate indis indicators, including of resilience, of capacity to innovate, and we need to be able to refine recommendations through action of uh, feedback loops to create easy to use tools, things that people can actually use to match options to sites and circumstances on the ground. This means partnering with development organizations and the private sector in innovation platforms at these sorts of scales and bridging knowledge systems so that we don't do what the farmers can already do with their local knowledge. We allow uh, them to fit things into their system but we give them uh, um, uh, sensible uh, options with information about it. Now, this is not classic participatory research. We're now aiming for scale, and we're integrating testing of options, delivery, uh, and institutional arrangements. It's not just project uh, M&E, because we're planning to generate the information needed as efficiently as possible using plan comparisons, and we're contributing to a global knowledge base, not just project requirements. And it's not just action research either. We've got learning principles contributing to a global knowledge base, and we're not just optimizing locally. So this uh, is moving things on, building on a lot of the experience, but attempting to tackle things at scale. So I hope today that we'll go on from farmer empowerment to thinking about how you empower millions of farmers, because that's uh, what we need to do over the next uh, decade if we're going to avoid uh, serious problems of malnutrition minus. Thank you.